Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barden, and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today we have our coal expert, Matt Warder of Seawolf Research. Matt has forgotten more about the coal sector than we know. Matt, thank you for coming back on the show. Steve, love talking to you. Happy to do it anytime and, and hate all your subscribers out there. Uh, let's, let's get into it. Love talking about coal anytime, but uh, especially when I'm, when I'm nestled in a hotel room here in New York about ready to attend the New York Coal Trade Association banquet. Uh, yes, clearly. yes. I, I hope you have your corset and everything ready. Uh, should be uh, should be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm happy for you. Picked up my tux and some Spanx earlier, so we should be good to go. <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, okay, so if you are new to the show or new to coal especially, we had Matt on a few months ago, and we went over the coal basics. We went over the difference between met coal, thermal coal, supply demand, terminology, seasonality, just kind of a coal 101 episode. And if you didn't see it, uh, you need to check that one out first. I'll put a link up here for you. It's one of our most successful episodes and consistently gets downloads every single day. So uh, go watch that and then come back here and that'll give you a baseline and understanding of the sector and some of the terminology. Okay, let's start out macro like we always do, uh, sure. uh, uh, Matt. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. And uh, so we got thermal coal. And the last time we had you on, you said we need to start paying attention to this one kind of around April, it should be hitting around the 220 to 130 range, which we're in now and that time frame. And you also said on Met Coal that we need to start paying attention to that one uh, once it gets down around the 250 range. And we've exceeded mm -hmm. that to our delight and we're sitting at 230 today. So what yep. is your uh, macro view of both of these markets uh, today? Right. Well, uh, for, for both of those markets, we're heading into uh, the shoulder season, basically, where there isn't a lot of contracting going on uh, for either one. Steel producers, uh, steel production in particular is a very lumpy business. Uh, so they tend to, you know, gather all their, uh, you know, get all their med coal supply squared away in the first few months of the year. Uh, and then they restock usually starting in midsummer, you know, right around July. Uh, in particular, India uh, has been a, a big supporter of the market over the long term, but their their Q3 budgets open up July 1st. So it's it's hard to say that we'll see a lot of uh, a lot of spot activity between now and then. And it's what the magazines will typically do is they'll just continue to mark down, uh, you know, mark down med coal prices uh, because there isn't enough activity to, uh, you know, to hang your hat on. So a lot of the deals that get done in this period are tend to be kind of off spec cargoes or uh, things like that. Uh, we're, we're heading into a period where production is probably going to slow down. A little bit, but all that serves to kind of put a floor under the market, and you know, 225 is kind of the, uh, you know, the the right around where we bottomed last year, um, and we're we're kind of there right now. Um, there have been a couple of things happening on the Met side, uh, particularly the, the the incident on the bridge in Baltimore, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, that I think is going to tighten up U.S. indices relative to Australian indices. So, you know, we're, we're not going to see hardly any spot activity in the U.S. So I think, you know, there's been this period here over the past six months where uh, Australian PLV premium low volatile cooking coal prices have been really high and the spread between the U.S. prices has gotten wide. Uh, that spread is tightened and it's almost at parity now. Um, I expect that to sort of be the case. And once they get sort of equal to each other, we'll bounce along. You know, that 225 level sound seems pretty reasonable. When you get down below 225, you'll see production cuts, and then the production cuts will will then hold up the market. So you know that takes about it takes about a quarter for that all to flesh out, and by that time we should see uh, you know the the Indian buyers back into the market uh, to buy uh, post monsoon season cargoes. Like you can't have anything delivered into India if there's risk of hurricane, so they wait until uh, July and then they buy September cargoes uh, for those ships to come in afterward. On uh, and temperatures are getting warmer, so there's no real home heating demand uh, that's been, you know, keeping keeping gas prices, uh, you know, from from really bottoming. We're we're out of that phase now, and we're going to start to butt up around costs, I think, you know, which which are down at that 120, you know, 115 dollar level uh, for Newcastle. We've had a bit of an uptick here over the last couple of months. I think that is 
partially to do with the with the bridge collapse in Baltimore. Um, but uh, but in general, from April until June is not a time when the thermal coal market tends to rise unless there's a really serious supply issue. And uh, we don't we don't know enough yet quite about Baltimore to you know know what that's going to do to global supply, uh, you know, at at a hundred percent level. Uh, but uh, yeah, we we have some we have some information that's been trickling in. Uh, we're starting to put the pieces together. We'll get a better picture of that, I think, as the months go on. Okay. All right. So um, we're basically entering the shoulder season, just like we talked about the last time you were on the show. So it's very normal for for the uh, Met coal prices to uh, correct like they have, uh, yep. which creates what we like to call buying opportunities. Buying opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it to go out. until July or so, maybe right. hitting around the 225 level or so. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's good news. It's it's basically right on track. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the gift that comes to mind. I've had a lot of people go, "Is this is this normal?" <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. Uh, the you know that first time gift where they're all you know hanging on the boat or what. That's that's kind of what comes to mind. This is perfectly normal uh, off season behavior for coal markets, and because prices have been so high, the markets have added volatility. So now there's you know, volatility to the downside. But we really are kind of pushing up against costs uh, right now. If you think about Met coal, like Alpha, uh, for instance, uh, I got my trusty Alpha jumper on here today. Um, you know, their costs are about one hundred and ten dollars at the mine, and then you add in, you know, about fifty dollars for transportation, so that's one sixty. Uh, and then if you add in SG&A uh, and taxes, that's another ten. That's one seventy. And then if you tack on sustaining capex, that's another ten dollars. That's one eighty. Uh, then you adjust for metric tons. Well, you're right at 198, 200. So, uh, you know, below, you know, the 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 price where you'd see, uh, you know, people making a five percent profit or ten percent profit, something like that, is where you're going to start to see pullbacks in production. And we're we're almost there. Um, it'd be pretty seasonally normal. Uh, but I th I think the the moral of the story is, you know, kind of understand, you know, relative pricing for the equities if you're interested in any of the equities, and then. Uh, you know, and just wait and watch. Like, there's no need to rush into anything here. If you're building a position, you can take three months to build it here. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we need to find out is how, how robust is demand going to be in the back half of the year uh, and what's going to be the long-term effects, if any, uh, of Baltimore. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, all right. Uh, AB wants to know, what is the bear case for coal? And how would you uh, respond to the argument? Um, so, the, well, the bear case for coal in general is, you know, on the thermal side, we're going to use less of it. It's uh, it's more economic to build a gas plant than it is a coal plant, at least in the United States. Uh, so, you know, the countries that are going to use coal going forward um, are going to be the ones that you know, either have reserves on it or can get it relatively cheaply uh, from Indonesia or somebody like that. So it's going to be more of a developing country uh, story than it is a developed market. It's developed markets, the writing's on the wall. We moved from you know thermal coal over to you know gas based uh, you know dispatchable power system. You know we want to plug in renewables, uh, batteries, and all those sorts of things. But uh, that uh, that that idea, whilst uh, you know noble in its pursuit, is going to take some time to ripen, so to speak. So uh, you know thermal coal is a market that's in decline, um, but there's still a lot of still a lot of meat left on the bone. And if we have any supply issues with gas, for sure, uh, or coal. Like we always have, uh, then you know there's there's going to be periods of of big upside in prices. Like I, I think about a five year cycle, you'll have one really amazing year and one kind of not so great year, and everything else is going to be somewhere in the middle to some degree. Okay, all right. So as uh, first world countries move from coal to gas, that's a little bearish, but uh, there's enough countries like um, India that uh, that are going the other way. So. That's right. And then and then on the Met side, we have we have, you know, the greening of the steel industry. But uh, Koala, uh, who I had dinner with last night, we had a great conversation. I actually saw Sul uh, Brian Sullivan from CNBC. It was like right outside. Uh, oh, cool. It's just wild. Um, but, uh, you know, he made he made a good point the other day in that, uh, you know, it's taken us however many hundreds of years to, you know, you know, wean ourselves off of uh, oil, uh, and but sure, we're going to you know decarbonize the steel industry in twenty years. Of course, we're not. It's going to it's going to be a long, slow burn, just like everything else. Um, you know, there are technologies that are going to eat into it as economies become more mature. They can you know move to electric arc furnaces and recycle steel. Uh, you know, that's that's the stage basically that China's in right now. 
Um, you know, and the, the question, you know, for the bear case is, does that go really fast or does that go really slow? Um, there aren't a whole lot of other projects coming on, so it's it's pretty hard to see, uh, you know, a significant downside on on met coal for any extended period of time. But uh, you know, I just went through Alpha's costs at the port. When you factor everything in, everybody's around two hundred bucks in in Queensland. Uh, the royalties on a two seventy five met coal price are sixty two U S dollars. Wow. So yeah, so if your if your mining costs are in the hundreds, I mean, you're already right here at, uh, you know, banks are starting to wake up to the fact that the long-term price isn't $150 anymore. Most of them are saying $175, $185. I think that's pretty light if we're going to have a royalty regime that is that, uh, you know, oppressive to producers in Queensland. It really shifts the cost curve uh, dramatically. Uh, and that is very unlike any other period of the market that I've seen. So I think I think the floor for Medcoal, the, the bear case is China moves very quickly in developing a scrap market or alternately uh, produces their steel demand declines so rapidly that they just produce a lot of Coke and then export that Coke to India per se. So China's decline in that sense would uh, not only require less Coke and coal, but also they would take some of the demand away from the only country that's materially growing. Um, is that a possibility? Yeah, but I mean, that's that's kind of everybody's bear case. So it's not a, not a particularly original one. That's That's been a head scratcher for some time and so far, uh, you know, at least that has that has yet to come true. Might it in the future? Yeah, uh, but we, it's hard to see much longer than a five-year plan will allow you to see. And, you know, at least for the next five years, uh, there's enough uh, completions to be had in the real estate market, which isn't great for new starts, but, you know, they have this pipeline of construction that they have to complete uh, that should keep, uh, you know, virgin steel demand uh, relatively robust for, for a period of time. Do we need to reevaluate in three years? Yeah, probably do. Um, but uh, for the time being, I think the, 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 the landscape looks pretty reasonable. Okay. That's good news. Um, all right. We're going to move on to what you alluded to a second ago, the, uh, Baltimore bridge collapse. Yeah. Something and else. Unless you've been living under a bridge, pun intended, we can see the the container ship right here just ran into one of the pillars and, uh, you know, pretty sad. Uh, several people have lost their lives. Yeah. Um, uh, this can't be good for shipping lanes. What, um, uh, <laughs> no. what, what do you, what do you see happening with this? Um, what, what companies are affected? What, uh, what's going sure. on? What updates do you have? So, you know, the, the main publicly traded companies that export out of Baltimore are Consol, uh, that, that exports pretty much all of their thermal coal through Baltimore. Okay. Uh, they, own a, they own a terminal that is upstream from, uh, or, or, yeah, upstream from, uh, from the bridge there. So now they can't get Panamaxes in to load and get them out. Uh, you need a draft of about 39, 40 feet for, to load a fully loaded Panamax. And uh, last I heard, they were somewhere between 10 and 15 feet. Uh, there's a small there's a small lane which uh, tugboats can pull barges through, but that's that's not going to get you any sort of coal loadings. Uh, the south on the south uh, shore, uh, you know, near Dundalk is Curtis Bay. Um, it's pretty near uh, Sparrows Point, which was an old U.S. steel plant back in the day. Um, so Curtis Bay uh, a few years ago had an explosion uh, and was shut down for a few months. So we've we've seen uh, we've seen this story a little bit before in that sense. Um, Arch is the main exporter through Curtis Bay. They they take their uh, production from their Lear and Lear South mines in in north central West Virginia, uh, in Grafton, uh, which is you know where my dad was born, you know about thirty miles from where I grew up. Uh, that coal flows out of Baltimore, and so they'll what they did a few years ago was they rerouted uh, some shipments down the ninety five corridor and took it out of Newport News, where Arch has some uh, some uh, they they own a percentage of Dominion Terminal Associates. Uh, which is a coal export facility down there. Um, that is a much more expensive haul. It costs about you know $35, $40 to get it to Baltimore. In uh, Consol has a great deal with, uh, with CSX getting it over there at about 20 or 25 because they do so much volume. Um, but the, the move to get it down to Newport News, you have to go north and then over and then south down 95. You're competing with uh, track space with Amtrak. Uh, the crews are going to be hard to get. They, they were a few years ago. But that is an escape valve that they have. But instead of costing 40 bucks, it costs probably 60, 65. So the 
the, the margin on export tons for Arch uh, is going to be materially affected for a little bit. Um, both of those companies can also probably truck uh, truck the coal to a barge facility uh, on the on the Monongahela River or um, uh, or the Ohio River and and ship it through the Gulf maybe that way. But I, I think more more likely than anything else, you'll probably see you know Consol cut back production. They have a fifth long wall that they have some flexibility with. Um, you know, I, I think they were going to do some long wall moves in the first or second quarter anyway. So maybe they maybe they take some time to do maintenance and right size shipping. Uh, you know, maybe Arch ships a little bit through Newport News. Uh, maybe ships you know a, a container or two through the Gulf or something. Uh, but it's you know it's not going to be much. I think I think most mostly we're going to wait and see how long it takes to to clear the shipping channel. And I've heard between four weeks to eight weeks. Uh, I've heard three months. I've heard it could take a lot longer because they have to do environmental assessments. Nobody knows is the is the point. It's it's going to take a while. Uh, that that has tightened up uh, you know thermal coal supply specifically and also closed the gap between U.S. U.S. high vol A coals and um, uh, you know, in, in Australian PLV. Um, but I, I don't think we're going to see a resolution here anytime soon. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to get as much information as I can, but there just isn't a lot uh, at this stage. So it's a, it's a wait and watch. It's, it's buoyant for, for us coal indices, which is fine, but it's, it's pretty, it, it's pretty bearish, I think for Consol and for Arch uh, in the short term. Uh, they will have the ability to make up those tons later. Um, it's possible. So, you know, maybe not all is lost, but it's uh, it's very touch and go at the moment. Okay, so the two main companies are Consol and um, and Arch, Arch that are affected by this, and yeah. uh, they can still get it out, but not nearly the volume or the cheap cost. That that's right. And then also, if we think about the flip side of this, when the shipping channel does become open, there's a whole lot of high vol coal that's going to come out of Baltimore, and so I think when that happens, you'll see the the high volatile coal indices for the U.S. really dip relative to low vol. Uh, an Australian PLV. So that's something to watch on the backside. You know, right now we have, you know, prices are buoyant, but production isn't great for those companies. Later on, we're going to have, you know, booming production and the prices aren't going to behave so well. So there's a lot to sort of, you know, take into account as we move on through the course of the year. So that might create a real buying opportunity kind of in that hot minute moment, right? Yep, it, it will. And obviously, you know, within six to eight months, you know, any kind of supply restructuring, uh, you know, is is pretty well absorbed. Took took about that long for us to absorb the 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 musical chairs of shifting Russian trade flows in 2022. And uh, I, I would I would figure for something like this, if there's a you know big downshift in in exports that'll have the opposite effect on the other side, we'll see something similar. So so you know it's it's buckle up time, but also uh, you know make your shopping list. And uh, when when prices get to pretty reasonable levels, uh, you know you feel free to establish it. Like what I usually tell people is, you know, is I don't think this is a market right now where you want to buy, you know, uh, 3% position all at once. Like you want to buy 25 bips, you know, or like every time you get paid, uh, maybe, you know, make a small purchase. And if, and if the, if the price gets to a point that's really attractive, you know, then you can maybe buy, buy 1%, but we're not in a hurry. Um, it's going to take a while to figure out. Okay. All right. Good news. We like that. Um, okay, moving on to the uh, coal ETF, mm -hmm. uh, we've got, um, uh, so you helped put this thing together, which is pretty cool. Last time we had you on, it was just beginning and we were under 1 million market uh, in, in net assets on this thing. Now we're over four. Uh, here's the uh, makeup, yeah. AMR makes up the biggest, then Yan Coal, Whitehaven, Warrior, Arch, um, ARLP, Console. Um, what, um, <clears throat> Deep River wants to know, when is the best seasonal time to invest in the coal ETF? Is that kind of this next, uh, uh few months, like you're talking about, <laughs> maybe just like every couple of weeks when you get your paycheck, just dollar cost average yeah. into this thing? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and again, like, I don't think there's a rush necessarily, but, uh, but yeah, it, this should be the season where prices should correct to the point where, uh, they become sort of attractive again. I've been, uh, I haven't done it for every company, but uh, I've occasionally made the uh, the laser eyes tables uh, with the, with the Vince McMahon meme, and, and those are, those are just like you know interesting little technical spots that that have clearly attracted a lot of interest in the past. Uh, and you know, knowing how uh, you know chartists tend to work, it's uh, you know they'll they'll be eyeing those price levels 
that's probably where a lot of limit orders are set up. Um, so, so those are the areas of interest. Uh, you, you know, if you, so sometimes I repost it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll pull I'll pull it up for AMR. It's pretty funny. Um, it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, Clint wants to know. He says, uh, uh, if you had to build your own mini ETF, so you helped up set, set that one up, which had thirty companies, uh, a mini ETF of three to six coal stocks to be held for several years. You know, mm -hmm. which which ones would be in it? Okay, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I didn't really set up this. This was, uh, you know, Range's uh, a company that's run by Tim Rotolo. Well, you con consulted on it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they reached out to, to us, which I thought was really cool. Uh, and, you know, they had, uh, the distribution was a little bit different. Uh, you know, they wanted to sort of shy away from small caps uh, and, and make sure they got the big boys. And then all we basically said was like, look, you have net markets, you have thermal markets, here are... Um, you know, here are the, you know, the top companies for each. Uh, and then, you know, they kind of took that, uh, that broad advice and then took it from there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think how they have it set up is, you know, you're winding, you're winding up with kind of the, you know, the best in class or whatever on the Met side, uh, you know, the, the barbell approach is, you know, a combination of uh, AMR and, uh, and, uh, and, and warrior uh, HCC, um, you know, AMR has, you know, has the tons, uh, you know, biggest med coal uh, uh, producer in the United States, um, and Warrior has uh, the the growth uh, and really excellent cost structure, and is you know uh, bear market resilient. Uh, you know, from a from a production perspective, because the costs are just fantastic down there. Very very short haul to port from the from the coal fields up around you know Brookdale, Tuscaloosa area down to Mobile. Not not very long at all. Uh, compare that to the you know, the very, you know, very long hauls from, you know, Eastern Kentucky, Southern West Virginia, all the way over to the ports of Virginia, um, just to, you know, better cross structure there. So th those are the two on the Met side uh, that that you can, you can pretty much recommend without any reservation. On the thermal coal side, uh, and I know we just talked about how it's probably not going to be a great few months for them, but uh, Consol is the lowest cost uh, exporter of thermal coal into Europe, um, provided that uh, you know, there's some resolution to the terminal, like that's, you know, that's a company I think you should probably think about on that side. But uh, but also Yankol, talking about cost structure, um, you know, Yankol is a dividend paying uh, equity. Um, it, it's it's probably, uh, you know, one of the one of the barbells you need to hold on the thermal side if that's the market that you're more interested in or whatever. I'm I'm pretty strictly met these days because, uh, you know, we're kind of at the bottom of a market and the long term price is going to be more resilient. But uh, you know, to say we're not going to have any any problem any problems with thermal coal supply in the future, I think is probably uh, spoken too soon. Um, and then you have the the hybrids, uh, you know, BTU, Peabody, uh, and Whitehaven. Uh, so these companies are now basically both 50-50 uh, thermal and met. Uh, Whitehaven has excellent quality thermal coal, very good costs, uh, and the the two met mines they acquired, you know, aren't the greatest met quality in the world, but the cost structures on them are excellent. Uh, and, you know, although the, the relativity pricing for uh, pulverized coal injection, PCI, uh, and, uh, and for Semisoft uh, aren't, aren't great, they, they are improving relative to where they've been here over the last few months. And, and again, the cost structure, those mines are going to make margins even at the, the troughs of markets going forward. So, I mean, those are, those are probably the six that you want to pay attention to right now. Um, you can make a case for, for Arch, uh, you know, I think once, once the Baltimore situation is resolved uh, should probably be in the in the top five there uh you can make a case for for several others as well but just off the top of my head i think that's that's probably where we're at now okay all right so uh amr warrior handling the met side handling the mm -hmm. thermal side console uh yan coal and then mm -hmm. uh the what you call the hybrids the 50 50 mix uh white haven and uh, btu mm -hmm. okay awesome uh all right on Glencore, um, what are your thoughts on Glencore's acquisition of uh, uh, Tex Coal assets? Um, talking, uh, talking about margins, right? Oh, I mean, those mines are just giant money makers. Um, I mean, that's going to be a fantastic acquisition for them. You know, and I still am kind of flabbergasted that Tech really wanted to sell them that badly. You know, they, they got a decent price for it uh, in all, but. You know, it's it, the structure is really strange and it's very backloaded. But that's, I mean, that's kind of what you have to do in order to get a, a deal done that big in the coal space. Now, there's only a handful of people who can digest it. Glencore is one of them. Uh, they're, you know, Glencore is going to do exactly with 
with with Elk Valley Resources, the same that they did uh, when they bought uh, Cerrojon in Colombia. They're going to, you know, mine it out, make all the money that they can for it, you know, ride it hard and put away wet. Um, that's it's kind of what they do. Uh, you know, from a trading perspective for them, this, this is going to be, you know, a huge game changer, you know, access to to that much material. Um, I think much like, uh, I don't I don't think Glencore is going to do this, but uh, they will have the option similar to, you know, Whitehaven, uh, you know, likely selling down a portion of Blackwater to a steel company. I mean, Glencore will have the option to do that if they want. Um, I'm not sure they're going to take take anyone up on the offer, but uh, there's there there is concern. Um, at the at the steel plant level, at the coke making level, that we're not going to have you know these really excellent quality coking coals for very long. You know, you look out twenty years and pickings get pretty slim. So these are really you know treasured assets by the industry. And um, uh, you know, I look forward to see what what Glencore does. But certainly look forward to, what, to see what it's going to do for the free cash flow. Good lord. <laughs> yeah, I, I I did some quick napkin math about a month ago, and I think it was a year and five months for them to like make this up. And and may, maybe I was off on that by a little bit, but I I think it's pretty close. So yeah, pretty pretty it's impressive. Be like two two three years probably something like that. There, okay, there's some, that long. Okay. Yeah, there's some incentive payments on the back end too. That you know, basically get a royalty, not in perpetuity, but for like eight years or something like that until uh, the amount's been paid off. Uh, and, uh, I missed that. Years. Okay. Okay. So, but it's uh, it's not going to matter. I mean, those those mines are going to make money hand over fist for you know two decades. So yeah, you know, great job. Okay, all right, cool. Um, all right, moving on to AMR, uh, our little darling here. Uh, this is what the uh, stock chart looks like. So last time we had you on, we were floating up around here, and you said that hang on, shoulder season hasn't come yet. Uh, right. So we got it, and uh, sure th did. these are our limit orders here. We got another one set for 300. We had one down here at, at 265, nothing scientific, just lining up with the 200 moving average. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where you uh, uh, where you had your Vince McMahon uh, below $400, 350, 300, 265. <laughs> yeah. Not an accident. Yeah. Are, is yeah. that is that still kind of what you're looking at for? Uh, um, uh, yeah. for AMR here, does that seem accurate? Like, does that seem realistic that that we could get down there, maybe two sixty five, two fifty? I mean, we're we're in a we're in a season where you know the spot price is. I don't want to say it's not real, but it's you know it's pretty close to being a fugazi. The you know the the the, the assessors can sort of write down whatever it is that they want here at this point in time, and it's going to make sense because there's no activity. Yeah. Um, you know, for for the U.S., I would argue that whatever the last trade was is what the price is, you know, not whatever you're guessing here today, because if somebody had to come into the market in the U S and say like, shoot, there's no high ball a, I need a high ball a cargo. Now, what would they pay for it? Would they pay 260? Probably 270, maybe. Um, so it, it's, it's just, you can't, I can't justifiably assess the United States based off of what Platts prints or, you know, or what, what PLV does. They're two separate markets. The Atlantic market is Europe and Brazil. You know, the Pacific market is is much more active, you know, with Australia and China. Like the, to me, they're just two separate animals at this point. Uh, and probably, you know, Platts and and uh, fast markets, Argus all need to do, you know, more periodic uh, estimates of, of U.S. stuff. It's, it's just not a daily market. Right. So, uh, you know, could we get down, you know, could prices get down below 200? Sure. Uh, but does that mean anything? How much, how much, tonnage is going to be contracted at that uh, at that price for a quarterly delivery you know i'd venture to say not a whole lot there'll, there'll be spot cargoes here and there uh you know people who have too much coal on the ground they need to get it out to market um but you know when the buyers come back in july how long does that take to clean up uh you know usually it's about a month or a month and a half or something like that and prices stay you know pretty strong until september but you know for for my money it's like it, you just draw a line at 200 and draw a line at 400 uh we're going to spend you know more time below the midpoint than above it over the course of a five-year cycle but those are kind of the low points and high points to look for you know in a you know in, the, in this particular cyclical commodity you know can we go to 185 for a few weeks sure no big deal can we stay at 185 for two years i don't think so Okay, and when you say two hundred to four hundred, you're talking about the Met coal price, not yeah. not the share price of AMR. 
no, no, yeah, yeah, two hundred dollar, two hundred dollar med coal, uh, you know, that's that's about where their break even is. They're pretty close to it, something like that. You know, once you include SGNA and taxes and, and all that sort of stuff, like they they could go for a little bit. Um, the uh, but uh, you know, I, I think right around that level is like two sixty five is you know we might we might touch it there. Okay, awesome. Um, all righty, uh, moving on to Warrior Met Coal. Uh, so Colin wants to know, how much more cash does uh, Warrior have to put aside to complete their Blue Creek mine? Looks like they've got $750 million in cash as of the end of last year. Yeah, I, I forget what, uh, I mean, the total spend on is going to be about $1.1 billion, which uh, when, they, when they first announced the project years ago, uh, you know, they were saying 750 million would probably be enough to do it. Now that's not the case. There's been cost inflation at the uh, equipment level, cost inflation at the labor level. So it's it's just you know going to cost a pretty penny more. Uh, but I think like 1 billion, 1.1 billion, uh, you know, gets the job done totally. I forget how much they've spent to date. Um, uh, it's an easy number to look up, but I don't have it in front of me. But uh, I think 750 will get them pretty close to to the to the goalpost. Uh, with what they got now so you know I, I would think that any any money that they make incrementally in the, in the near term you know could be you know stuck in the bank i mean they're going to issue dividends because that's what they prefer to do uh you know while they're while they're building the the operation and you know so i think we talked about last time i while i'd like to hear from them like the words yes when we're done with this we're going to buy back stock like maniacs would love to hear that <laughs> um you know i, I kind of understand what it is that they're doing and you know, if they don't get Blue Creek right, there that causes a lot more problems. So, their their priorities are are in line. You know, with uh, you know what what the long term goals are. And I think even Walton Walter Dale mentioned on the call, like you know, they're not a quarterly. They don't measure themselves quarterly. They measure themselves annually. So, you know, when we have to keep in mind as investors, like you know, sometimes like our short term uh, ideas get conflict a little bit with how management tends to think of running their operations. Okay. All right, that uh, that makes sense, and we're going to move on to Ramico. Uh, so Casey and Tony want to know the difference between uh, METC and METCB. So yep. the, the same company. What 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 what's the difference here? Is it just different exchanges or something? What? Uh... Uh, no, no, it's uh, uh, METCB is the royalty company. Uh, ah, oh, so it's not the same. Company. It, it, it's essentially the same. Like Ramico pays a royalty on, on their mines to METCB. So uh, so now, like if I were costing Ramico's operations uh, and assigning a royalty price to them, uh, it would be significantly lower than, than any of their competitors. Like usually about a 7% royalty is pretty typical. You know, I'm, he, he, they probably have a, you know, 1% royalty, like a nominal royalty that they pay from their own operations. Which helps keep their you know overall cost down at the mine level, um, but they have royalties on it that METCB collects from. Okay. So it's METC is where all the the big cash flow is going to come through. Uh, METCB is uh, is is going to bounce around with coal prices like any like any other coal linked asset would. Um, you know, there's no reason not to own both. If you own one, you might as well own both because you get the the benefits of having the whole company. Um, but you know, if you're if you're just looking for coal production, uh, you know, and growth, you know, that's going to come from METC. So it sort of depends. I, I think you have to do the analysis of both of them all at the same time. Um, I haven't done that because I'm lazy. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm and I mean to be fair, like I mostly do supply demand price forecasting. So the the tons are more important to me necessarily than royalties. I just need to know how to cost. Uh, the operations and then i'm i'm usually good to go for the most most of the work that i do okay okay and we also got a lot of questions on corsa coal so mike conlon david contrarian carlos domino uh maybe just some uh, uh macro of uh corsa um yeah yeah so uh so corsa is you know small company about 800 to to uh 1.2 million uh, in in uh, production of low volatile coal, they have a little bit higher sulfur content, so they get uh, a discount relative to other you know regional low vols in northern and central app. Um, the issue for them is cost. Uh, it always is. Uh, their costs are in the 130s, 
you know, if they export, they export out of Baltimore as well. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that rail haul will be about 40 bucks here, one step close to 190. So, if, you know, U.S. prices, you know, get down to that level, they're, they're not going to be able to export as much. But mostly, you know, they sell, they sell to traders who use them in blends and, and those kinds of things. And I think that's mostly what they've been doing. Uh, for last year, a bit bit of an enigma on that side. Their domestic contracts uh, are barely break even, uh, so they're not making a whole lot of money off of their domestic business in 2024, which is part of the reason why the stock's down so much. Um, now it, it got a huge bid uh, yesterday, the day before, like up 20 percent or something. I have no idea what was going on with that. Um, somebody came in to establish a position and was price insensitive, it looked like, um, but you know there wasn't anything in the coal market to sort of warrant it. Um, so the mines that they have, you know, a couple of them are in uh, terminal decline. Only have a few few years of reserves left, two or three, something like that. They have another mine, uh, Kaiser, that they could bring on. Uh, I think they have one other project that they could bring on as well and double production. You know, we can get them up to about two million tons a year, uh, but that would require, I don't know, 30, 40 million in capital that they don't have at the moment. So, you know, Corsa is a, is an opportunity for somebody to come in, uh, you know, and either take control of the asset and then expand it and flip it, or alternately, uh, you know, just to, they're, they're waiting until you know the point where their you know cash flow isn't huge, and then somebody could come in and pick them up uh, for for not a lot. I mean, that's that's kind of it's kind of where they're at. Like if, if I'm buying them now, I I would buy them as a speculative acquisition. Uh, more so than anything else, or just a call option on upside in Metcol, because if you know Metcol goes back to four hundred bucks, uh, course is going to course is going to do well because they're making all their incremental dollars off the export. Okay, all right, yeah. So super small market cap. I think it was like twenty five million Canadian or something, yeah. um, and uh, very leveraged to the coal price, but also very very speculative. And judging by the amount of questions that we got on it, I think it's probably a bigger <laughs> part of people's portfolio than maybe uh, it should yeah. be. But it is, just... it is not a very it is not a very big part of mine. Um, I did have a pretty sizable position in it last year uh, because uh, it looked like they were going to make it. Uh, you know, they had the the resolution of um, uh, there was a part DOJ case that was pending against a former employee there. Um, and uh, that, that finally got resolved. When that happened, I was more comfortable uh, pulling into them. And then uh, I owned them all the way through uh, August and they got uh, a department of transportation, a Pennsylvania department of transportation settlement for like millions of dollars, $25 million or so. Um, and uh, and the st stock was basically like a double or a triple over that period of time. So I, I cut it there. Uh, that kept a little bit, but uh, it's, you know, I had a trailing stop on it and eventually stopped out, but it was a, that was a fun ride. Now, now we're on the other side of it. Uh, the domestic contracts is what's, what's holding them down this year. But um, if we get a good run up in August uh, in Metcoal prices that uh, then, and they can, you know, price domestic tons at like 150, 160 bucks, uh, their 2025 would, would be looking great. So stay tuned. It's okay. Basically, basically All right. Uh, okay, let's, uh, oh, <clears throat> quick one on um, uh, Stanmore. Uh, so Ben and Feedback uh, basically want to know, um, what do you think uh, about the outlook for uh, Stanmore versus uh, Wood McKenzie on Met Coal in the long term? It says, I uh, believe that Stanmore predicts less than 2% growth versus McKenzie's 15% by 20, 2050. Yeah, um, I'm I'm not sure what Sandmore's position is on that, but but Woodmax, uh, you know, output I'm I'm pretty familiar with being an ex Woodmacker myself. Um, you know, basically the 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 increase in tons is coming is coming from Australia, and depending on who you listen to, uh, that number can range anywhere from you know four or five million tons over the next couple of years to like twenty five million tons by 2030 or whatever. Um, the Australian government themselves uh, put out a report that estimates about 17 million tons in uplift uh, by 2029 or 2030. Um, I, I can see where all those tons would be coming from, and they're all plausible. It's just a question of are they needed. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, other, the other thing to kind of remember is there, there aren't really any upside surprises in mining ever. <laughs> like only, only downside surprises. Uh, and usually that, that has production. I mean, there's, uh, there's going to be they have a cyclone season every year, um, every, you know, five, six years or so. There's a, you know, there's a weather event that, that affects, 
uh, you know, production in Queensland. Um, it's not like clockwork, but it's, you know, you, you get that one random year where just the port shut down for a month. And when that happens, uh, you know, prices get back up, you know, well above 300, uh, you know, in years past when, you know, we, we didn't have the scarcity that we do now. Um, you know, do I think that, you know, 17 million tons of production growth is a little aggressive? Yeah, I probably do. Um, but is it, you know, is it 10? Is it nine? Is it 12? Like, it's definitely seven or eight, um, for sure. Uh, I, I think I could see probably a path to 12. Um, pretty reasonable. But, you know, uh, Bow and Coke and Coal just shut down operations. So, Cost is is clearly an issue, and like I said before, that that royalty rate in Queensland is a real albatross around the neck of producers. There, I mean, sixty dollars to produce at what the average price has been for the last ten years uh, is a lot, is a whole lot. So unless the unless the law has changed, which is probably a bigger risk to the medical market, to be frank, than a collapse of China. Uh, if they change that law back, uh, then you know, then then the cost curve changes again. And then we have to reevaluate everything. So, you know, I'd caution on all forecasts, including mine, they're really just a snapshot in time. You know, they're not a not a prediction. They're not a, a crystal ball or anything like that. It's just this is how we see the world right now. And you can ask questions like, well, what would happen if such and such happened? Uh, I find those when, when you have a model that's pretty good and it works, those are the things I think that you could be more active in trying to solve for, you know, what happens if, you know, sanctions on Russia go away, do trade flows normalize? Um, we're not really asking a lot of those questions now because I don't think anybody really knows, you know, yeah. what, what the future holds. All, all, I, all I can say is if I look at the entirety of the Met coal landscape, you know, we're pretty short, uh, very high quality, hard coking coal uh, as soon as the end of the decade. I mean, we're short now, but there, there's a little bit of production that can come online to, to help quell that. Uh, but it's when you get out past 2030 and things start looking pretty, pretty slim. Uh, so if you have an aggressive view on, you know, the greening of the steel industry, then, you know, your, your long term price is going to be lower. If you have an aggressive view on uh, taking off Russia sanctions, your long term price might be lower. Uh, so, like, all those things matter. You know, it's not just like what's the long term price. It's what are all of the pieces that, that comprise your view that, that result in that particular long-term price that's important to ask. And, you know, all we know between Stanmore versus Wood Mac is that they're using different assumptions. And I don't know which one is right or which one is wrong, or if they're, they're probably both wrong, if we're going to be honest. Um, but so am I. So <laughs> at, at the end of the day, it's more, uh, what is the directionality of, of the market? And, you know, Wood Mac's view is we're not going back to $600 med coal. And I, I'd probably agree with that. Uh, but they're also saying that the long-term price is higher now than it used to be. And I agree with that too. So, you know, yeah. I don't think we need to get into the weeds too much. Just, you know, I think we need more to understand that, you know, 200 to 400 is pretty reasonable range for prices. We can get down below that for a little while, um, but not long before it starts to affect production. And as soon as production gets affected, I mean, it's like, like Rick always says, uh, low prices are the cure for low prices. High prices are the cure for high prices. Uh, it's never been more true uh, than, than we see the in the token coal industry now. Okay, yeah. If if the price gets too low and they 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 actually have to pay people to take the coal, they're simply going to shut it down, and then yeah. that will create less supply and yeah. and it'll well, catch this, up. This this is what being free of debt allows you to do. You you are allowed to be more price sensitive when you don't have to pay back, you know, a bank uh, for for a loan that you're obligated to service. So. So I, I think we're going to see, you know, discipline, I don't think is the right word. I just think we're going to see more price sensitivity uh, going forward from producers. Okay. All right. Let's move on to thermal coal. Uh, uh, console. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, uh, Sandro is basically asking, um, uh, what, what, what's, your, uh, what's your take on uh, console? Lowest cost thermal coal provider. Uh, if you're going to invest in thermal coal, they're a must own. Um, I don't think thermal coal is is as uh, op opportunistic a place to to park money in right now. Um, and certainly with the Baltimore uncertainty, uh, you know, tread with caution here in the near term. Um, all that said, caveats aside, uh, I mean, they operate 
I mean, they're the best long haul operators in the United States, certainly, maybe the world. Uh, you know, they have a they have a great operating culture. Uh, you know, Jimmy uh, Brock, who's the CEO, uh, was you know started in the mines and worked his way up. So like this is this is a company that like takes care of their people. Uh, they're you know it's a great great company to work for. Uh, you know, everybody's you know team player, um, and uh, and they have committed to whatever free cash flow they have. Uh, it's going to be dedicated to share buybacks because there's not really anything else to do with the money here right now. So, um, you know, I, I still like them because they're a low cost provider. Just uh, we're in a period right now where we have to tread with a little bit of caution, uh, you know, heading into heading into summer. Uh, we'll, we'll know more. We'll, we'll know more about how confident we should be in July, we'll say. But okay. uh, great, great company. Uh, perfect. It's, it's one of those where if you own it, you know, do you cut it or do you just ride it out. I mean, I, I could see it getting down into the sixties probably. Um, but if it gets down in the sixties, yeah, yeah, I might, I might, might look to pick some up there. I haven't, I haven't done a, uh, uh, you know, a technical chart of that yet, but, uh, but I may, cause at some point in time there, there is going to be value there, especially given the, their commitment to capital returns. Okay. Okay. I can, I can pull that up real, real quick. If, uh, there we go. Sure. All right, so it's sitting at 82 right now. So you're saying around in the 60s, which would line up with a yep. boatload of back support. So I yeah. can see technically why you'd pick that. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, so, I, just, I just pulled that number off the top of my head. So. Oh, well, the, the, nice, nice, uh, nice one right there. It, yeah, so basically uh, uh, they're the best in, uh, on the planet as far as low-cost uh, thermal coal, but mm -hmm. you're far more bullish here on, uh, on met coal than you are thermal. So. Yeah. Uh, if, they, if they, if you know, right now, if they dip down into the seventies, which I think they might, you know, that would be the, uh, you know, stage one of, uh, of Jim McMahon memes. <laughs> the Vince McMahon. Okay. <laughs> All right. And we touched on them a little bit earlier when we asked about your, uh, uh, your, your, your top six ETF, uh, uh, pick. Um, so for the 50, 50, uh, hybrids, as you call them, uh, go ahead and uh, just give us a quick on um, uh, BTU Peabody and then uh, Whitehaven. Uh, BTU is growing. Uh, they have a, a mine, Centurion, that's going to come on here over the next few years. And even at, you know, pretty moderate uh, prices for premium low volatile coal, uh, it's going to add about, you know, $300 million to the uh, free cash flow to their, to their balance sheet. Uh, so BTU has, you know, quietly stepped into the buyback arena not as aggressively as AMR has, but they, they got the memo, which is great. Um, once really once Centurion comes on and, you know, full on in 27, uh, it's when they're going to really get going uh, on the, on the buyback purchases. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that, you know, we'll see at that point, you know, Metco prices, I mean, kind of where we are now, like, you know, 225 to 275 feels pretty normal, uh, you know, to me at this point. So, and, and like I said, at that level, that's another 300 million in cash flow for them. Uh, which will be great for that uh, that program. So it, you know, love them in the near term. You know, Whitehaven is is you know digesting, uh, you know, the purchase of of Blackwater and Donia, um, but uh, you know they're they're very de-risked by being 50-50 met thermal now. Um, so the you know the I definitely don't think we'll see you know five hundred six hundred dollar thermal again, maybe ever, uh, but certainly anytime soon. Uh, but, uh, you know, for, for those assets, you know, at the, you know, at the 5,500 price of, uh, you know, 90, 90 and above 90 and above, uh, and a, and a high CB Newcastle price of 125 and above, uh, they're, they're both going to be okay. Um, so, you know, the, the Met allows them to weather sort of any downturn, uh, going forward. And, and like I said, like they're, you know, of the, of the hybrid companies, they're probably top two on the list uh, because, you know, the cost structure at Blackwater and Donnie is, is so attractive. And then also, uh, you know, the, the high quality PLB that, that Peabody is bringing on at Centurion uh, is also really attractive. So those, those are, you know, kind of two things that, that make them, you know, unique more so than, than I think the other companies. Okay. Um, and let's see, uh, coal royalty. Uh, so natural resource partners, Mm -hmm. um man wants to know 
Vince McMahon guide for NRP, please. Right, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, so, so tempted the by their debt and free cash flow, 330 mil yeah. free cash flow on 1 billion market cap, rapidly killing debt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let, me, uh, let me pull it up here and we can do the Vince McMahon. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, I mean, they're they're an MLP, so obviously that limits who can hold them. And if you have, you know, foreign uh, subscribers or, or those sorts of things, they might not be able to hold it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I think I think we're basically at stage one right now, like this this 90 level. That's this is pretty interesting. You know, we okay. pulled back from 100, 105. And like, you know, you have to realize this is basically the royalty company for AMR. Uh, and and uh, they own some other Ramico properties, a lot of other properties and uh, Central West Virginia and royalties on on other things, lots of different verticals. They have a big royalty on soda ash, I think. Okay. I have heard anecdotally the soda ash market is not so great for 24, uh, but uh, you know, take that with a grain of salt because I'm not a soda ash analyst. Uh, but for for coal, uh, you know, obviously it's going to capture a little bit of the beta of what prices do because they're you know one of the one of the ones receiving it. But I think you know at the at the 90 level here. Uh, that is that is pretty interesting. Certainly below what is that eighty five? Uh, eighty five would and kind of be the next level here. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think as as far as on the technically on the chart. Yeah, and then if we get back down to get back down to what I said below eighty is pretty uh, looks pretty good there too. Okay, okay, and then I think laser eyes comes in at sixty five. 65 bucks is the stink bid. Yeah, right around right here. Oh, and that lines up with this back here. Yep. It's okay. got a lot of, got a lot of interesting support there. But like I don't I don't think we're in a regime where met coal prices are going to go back to where you can justifiably pay 40 bucks for this for this equity. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so getting getting down into this range is what we call a pipe dream. I think so. Uh okay. but I mean, you know, we have to wait and see. If China, if China collapses tomorrow, then you know, who knows? And all bets are all, wrong. All, well, I mean, if China collapses tomorrow, all my stocks are are screwed. So, it's all fine. <laughs> go China. That's right. Uh, okay, um, and uh, Matt's top pick. That is the final wrapping up here. Uh, um, okay, uh, at the moment, what would be his met? Best Met Coal play, and then Henry also wants to know best coal stock for a dividend play. All right, for the dividend, it's going to be Yankel. Uh, okay. So we'll get that one out of the way. Uh, you know, their cost structure is great. Uh, you know, prices have kind of stabilized for uh, you know the fifty five hundred kcal uh, Newcastle coal, which is the lower uh, lower quality, lower heat uh, mechanism. Uh, but that's that's them. You know, for you know, for the top pick, you know. I, I got to stand by my boys at AMR, um, you know, still is, you know, my price target still 450. It hit it once, you know, it's, it's going to hit it again uh, at some point in time. I would venture to guess that AMR would hit 450 before warrior doubles. Uh, so, you know, take that for what it's worth, but this is, you know, this is time to be acquiring both. We're being honest. Um, and over the next, uh, over the next few months, we'll have the opportunity to do so. Um, Warrior below, I mean, it's, I think it was up at 60 yesterday, which is kind of where it's, it, it has tended to stay. It's been very resilient, you know, during this downturn uh, in med coal prices, which has been really encouraging to see. Um, you know, if you, if you wind up getting a chance to buy that below $50, good Lord. I mean, that's, that's going to be fantastic. And likewise, you know, AMR at 265, uh, you know, becomes a bargain there as well. Um, at the, at the very least, we know at you know these met coal prices uh both of those guys are going to make money hand over fist you know one of them is going to grow one of them is going to buy back um it's for me it's like two two ends of a barbell here at this point in time so uh those are the those are those are the top three we'll just say uh the dividend play and then uh my my two-handed two-fisted barbell approach on the met side okay so on met side uh stink bid for amr is 265 uh, yeah, stink bid for uh, Warrior is is below fifty. That would be the laser eyes of Vince McMahon. I would, I would as be far as dividend excited. play, there's really no other uh, competition than Yankel. They just, they just pay. yeah, they, they've just crushed it here over the last year or so. Uh, it's it, you know it's weird. I don't I never do a whole lot. I'm mostly a Met guy, period. Uh, so I don't do a whole lot of work on the thermal coal side unless unless asked specifically, uh, and I rarely, if ever, do anything on the lower quality thermal side, but. 
I mean, Yanko has just been humming along down there and generating free cash flow at, you know, at high prices, at low prices, at every price. Uh, just, just been very good uh, getting the stuff out of the ground and getting it to market. So, um, and as long as, you know, as long as it's a Chinese owned company, if they're going to give money back, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the one, one great thing about it. So. Awesome. Um, Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Matt. We really appreciate you doing this on the road. We know you're traveling, and uh, so thank you. Um, any any final words? If uh, someone wants to get a hold of you for um, uh, for your research, uh, how can they do so? I mean, the, the easiest way to do it is just to ping me on Twitter at MF Order. Uh, I'm I'm really active on there. I mean, l- less active when I'm busy, obviously. But if you uh, if you ping me and ask a question or something like that, I'm I'm pretty pretty good about getting back to folks. So. And, and if I don't, ping me again. Uh, I'm, I'm friendly. I'm not going to bite. It's all good. <laughs> all right. We will put a link to your Twitter account in the show notes below. Uh, Matt, thank you again. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Will do. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate you. Yes. And if you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show and future content like this, there's a link down in the notes below. Thank you for tuning in. Hit the like and subscribe. And share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. Probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks. You have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.